Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, South Bay Baptist Church. I know most of you, but my name is Mark McGarren. I'm a member here at South Bay Baptist Church, and I'm honored to be with you today for Brandy and Michael Newmark's baptism, and I'm grateful for Pastor Long for reaching out to me. So before we get started, I would ask you to please join me in a moment of prayer. Father God, we are so grateful to you. Grateful for your son, grateful for Jesus, who not only di died on the cross for our sins, but made it possible, Father, that we can be reconciled with you for those that want a relationship with you, that the door is always open. We lift up the congregation and their families and extended families, Father God, whatever their needs are, spoken or unspoken. We ask, Father God, that the Holy Spirit come upon us today in church for our baptism, Father, is just a wonderful, wonderful event. In closing on prayer, Father God, we just give thanks to you once again. And I want to especially lift up Brandy and Michael Newmark and their parents for this wonderful occasion and this wonderful commitment to you, Father God. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. amen. First of all, Pastor Long asked me to share a story. I don't like podiums, I like to move around a little bit. Some of you may or may not know, I was Michael and Brandy's high school teacher for two years at Homestead High School. And we would talk about God, and Brandy and them would ask me, how was your week there, Sergeant? I was like, well, and I would always tell them about South Bay Baptist Church, and just a wonderful fellowship, and they would ask Ginny and I about our son James, and we would just talk. And I would talk to them about how much I enjoyed with my wife, volunteering at Vacation Bible School, and how we worked with all the other church members, and how uh, all the kids in the community were invited into our church for a week, and how it was just a, a beautiful ministry to, to bless the young children. So, I wanna share something about praying. I know we all have concerns, and we all pray about people in our family, we pray about people in the community, we pray for our country. And sometimes we pray and pray for people and we're like, why, why, why isn't this working? And, and I was guilty of that. I, I was praying for my students at Homestead High School. I was praying for specific people, and I was praying for the, my student body at large. But Brandy and Michael was in the general prayer. They were not in the specific prayer. And God taught me a valuable lesson. When a person's heart is ready, he will bring them forward. Our job is to continue to stand in the faith and continue to pray. So Saturday night this year, the night before Easter service, I was in my home office. Brandy texted me about 8 o'clock at night. Sergeant, my mother and I would like to go to church. Does your church have a Sunday morning service? Well, I said, Brandy, not only do we have a Sunday, early Sunday uh, service, sunrise service, we're going to feed you breakfast. <laughs> okay? So they came, and everybody here, this is a testament to your hearts. When they came to our church, everybody here was loving and open as God intended it to be, welcoming. And they couldn't stop telling me about just the wonderful people of South Bay Baptist Church. So you, they had a part in this as well. By the way, we all greeted a visitor that day because you never know. So you can give yourself, you know, be thankful to God that you were able to participate in that. So she continued to come, and they continued to come, and then she volunteered for vacation Bible school. It was during that week that she was, uh, I believe, helping Miss Nelson and the other teacher with the little kids. And she was hearing the word of God every day, every day, every day, and Miss Nelson told me, said, hey, she's asking some key questions. And since you were her teacher and her mentor, I think you should speak with them. So God put it in my heart, and on that Friday evening, the last day of vacation Bible school, Brandy and I went over and we said a prayer, and 
and she accepted Christ as her Lord and Savior. And I, I was telling everybody, Miss Nelson, the pastor, was like, hey, we, we, we got to get this baptism thing going. We, we can't let them go off to basic training for the Air Force Reserve. And they decided with their parents after a meeting with Pastor Long that they would follow through with the for baptism. And that's how we're all here today. So Pastor has allowed me to share a couple of scripture verses with you. So if you want to follow along in your Bible, we are going to be in the Great Commission in the book of Matthew. We're going to be looking at chapter 19, verse 20, 19 and 20. And I want to leave you with a theme while you're going there real quick. And I want, to, I, I want to put my high school teacher hat on, and I'm going to give you a, a question about the unit, so to speak. Why is baptism important? I want you to think about that when you get to Matthew and we look at the Great Commission. Why is baptism important? And I'm going to give you a couple of key points. One, <coughs> baptism is important to our Savior. Two, Jesus began his own ministry on earth by being baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. And for your own studying or further review, you can see John 1, verse 29 through 34, when you get a chance. Secondly, one of the last things Jesus commanded his disciples to do was to baptize new converts. So we look at Matthew 28, 19 and 20, and he says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end. I wanna give you a special note on that. Baptism is a very special moment in the, on your journey of faith. I also want to go with you real quick. We're going to look at the early church momentarily. We're going to go to the book of Acts, and we're going to look at chapter 2, verse 38, and we're going to look at some of the things that Peter said to the crowd. As you remember, that was the day that 3,000 people converted to Christianity. And of course, in a, new, in a new church, they had questions. So one of the essential questions I want to leave you with on that is, what was the first thing a new Christian was told to do following conversion? When the crowd asked Peter, and I'm paraphrasing, what do we do now, brothers? Peter replied in verse 38. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. So after someone decides that they're gonna follow Christ, they pray, they accept Christ, and they receive the Holy Spirit, they have to make a decision if they want to follow through with baptism. And my recommendation is that if you're a Christian and you believe in Christ is your Lord and Savior, and you've not been baptized, that maybe you sit down with Pastor Long and, and see if that is something um, that, that you should be praying about and thinking about. Lastly, I want to look at Acts 2, verse 42. And this title is The Fellowship of Believers. That has to do with attending church. They devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So how do we apply this? What's the application I, I wanna get through to all of you today? A Couple of things and we're almost gonna close. To grow in faith and to fulfill the mission Jesus has given us, we must regularly gather for instruction, worship, encouragement, and prayer. God never calls a Christian to go it alone, okay? He never says, go it alone, that, that, that a Christian is to have a life of solitary in their life of faith. Rather, 
it is in fellowship with other believers that we can become all he created us to be. And in closing, I want to put this with a military term. Brandy and Michael, I know you can hear me. You're going to be going off to basic training as a veteran, and the veterans in the, in the congregation know you're going to be busy. You're going to think there's not, you need more than 24 hours in a day. But on Sundays, on Sundays, during basic training, you go to chapel. In tech school, you don't let Satan tell you, oh, you got to wash your laundry today. You got too much to do. You don't have time to go to church. That is going to be key. And finally, I want to leave everyone with this thought. Does God desire you to be baptized? That is a question that you need to pray about. If you're not baptized, read the scriptures and have that conversation with Pastor Long to see if you fit within that. I thank you for your time. I thank all of you. I thank Pastor for the opportunity to speak before you all today. I wish you all a blessed Sunday and God bless you and your families. Thank you, Sergeant Mark. We appreciate that. That was all part of the lineup this morning to uh, uh, have Mark do the, the uh, devotional there because he was very instrumental in Michael and uh, Brandy's life, bringing them to the Lord Jesus Christ. I also have Pastor Greg with me up here today as their youth pastor, and uh, he also is just more of the watering, nurturing process. So we tried to get everybody involved in this uh, here very special occasion this morning. So we're going to have uh, Michael come down first. Pastor Greg is going to do uh, the baptism for Michael. Michael, come on down. Michael, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yes, I do. And have you asked him into your heart? Yes, sir. Michael, based on your profession, your faith, and your testimony in the Lord Jesus Christ, I hereby baptize my brother in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Buried in the likeness of Jesus, raised in the life of the resurrection. Amen. Praise the Lord. The, uh, Brandy, come on down. The water baptism by immersion is symbolic of the burial and the resurrection, the walking out of the water then in newness of life. So that is the why we, we use water, we have a baptismal pool. It thus demonstrates what took place during the time of salvation when uh, these young people call upon the name of the Lord. So Brandy, you make a public uh, statement of your faith. Have you confessed the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yes, sir. You know him, that you have the promise of eternal life. Yes, sir. Very well, then. I'm going to ask you to put your hand over your face. And then, based on that profession of faith, your testimony, I hereby baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. So this is a great day in the Lord. Uh, remember, after the service, we have the fellowship together. Everybody that's here now, you are invited to that also. I'm going to ask Charlie if you'll come up and, uh, and the choir for ensemble, and we'll continue on with the service as it is. Good morning, South Bay Baptist Church. Another hand for uh, the baptism. Praise the Lord for that. We know that there's a, a host in heaven just partying and celebrating when any, anyone comes to, to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can only imagine that they're also celebrating today as well. Ours be seated. Scripture reading this morning is in Luke. Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. Luke chapter 9, 57 through 62. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithsoever thou goest. 
And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Amen. As I said in Sunday school class, we're going to leave Elijah in the desert as he makes his way to Zarephath. But today we want to visit the, the uh, followers of Jesus. We want to be with Jesus for a, uh, a couple moments in this text, primarily the last verse, verse 62. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. There are several truths that we can glean from this this morning, and we want to look at these, especially as we do it in the context of the baptism uh, that we had this morning, which is a public demonstration, a public proclamation of an allegiance to Jesus Christ. Now, it's just not for uh, Brandy and Michael. That applies to all of us. That applies to every individual that has walked through, as we say, in the waters of baptism. Because the very word baptism itself, as it's used several times in Scripture, immediately means on identification with. We were baptized with Moses in the wilderness, is what uh, Paul would write to the Corinthian church. The people in the Corinthian church were at the boat in the wilderness with Moses. There were several thousand years that separated them. But yet the identification with Moses and the people of the wilderness, Paul is saying that the Corinthians can identify with that. They understand the connection between the two. Likewise, when we talk about baptism and as believers, we are making our identity with Jesus Christ. In this passage here this morning, Jesus is calling out and giving the opportunities, extended invitation for individuals to follow him. We were just going to take a look at that this morning and uh, break it down in, a, in just a, a short way to give us a better understanding of what it is to be a genuine Christian and how, what it means to be able to follow Jesus. And what was Jesus talking about and why did he challenge them with questions and statements like birds of the air have placed a nest, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. What did Jesus mean by let the dead go bury their dead? Or in, our, in this sermon this morning, what does he mean by putting your hand to the plow and looking back, you're not fit for the kingdom of God? These are the several of the uh, mentions of the text that I want to shed light on today. First, let us pray. Father, we do thank you that uh, a very special day, but now as we are challenged by the word of God, all of us in this auditorium, we remember perhaps that day when we called upon the name of the Lord. And uh, Lord, it's a text to remind us that there was a commitment that went with it. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would have his way, speak clearly to us, that we be challenged, encouraged, and by your grace, be able to serve you well and follow you in all of its implications. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Follow me. That's the, the main theme in these verses from 57 to 62. That's what Jesus is talking about. We just want to look at the last verse, and as we do, basically it's a two-part outline. I consider the, the first one this morning, and then the, the second half here this evening. So we're asking this question, following Jesus is... So what is it to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and to be a believer? Let me give you by a couple of thoughts by way of introduction, just to make, create somewhat of a context. For example, you can be a Boy Scout and have only camp out once or twice, some adventure, or maybe once or twice a year, and then all the rest of the time, you're still a Boy Scout. Even though you're not in the woods and the wilderness and starting campfires by rubbing two sticks together, you will still be able to put on the uniform, be a Boy Scout, and the two highlights would be those times when you're in camp. 
Another way to look at it, it could be this. You can be of a particular political persuasion, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or an independent. And every two years, you're going to be asked to go to the forefront and, and uh, support your candidate. But in the interim time, you're still of that political party. You haven't lost that identity. But yet, there are highlights that are there. And then look at it this way. You can belong to a church group. You can attend once a week and you can claim membership and still say, I'm a member of such and such a church. But you cannot claim to be a follower of Jesus by occasional acts of commitment. Like the Boy Scout could go out in the woods, the politicians, the political people can make their, wave their banners and their flags, Every other year, people can attend church once a Sunday. But when it comes to Christianity, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, it means it's more than just an occasional visit. It's more than every once in a while. It's a lifetime commitment. So the difference between an organizational affiliation and that of following Jesus is that it centers around the whole idea of a full-time, unconditional surrender and commitment to him. Now, you may not have known that when you were saved. It could be that uh, the, you, you were part of the, uh, all you had to do is call upon the name of the Lord, your sins are forgiven, and then no more was said after that. That's not the way Jesus presented the gospel. He always presented it in such a way that it, was, it would be a challenger to the candidate. It was a challenge to the, the, the individual that follow me without exception. And it implied an immediate follow me for the rest of your life. I fear that much of Christianity today centers around the, the act, the surrender, the calling upon the Lord. I trusted in Jesus. But then after that, there's this notion that eventually I will become stronger in my faith. Eventually I will become involved. In other words, they set up the delay. Some of that could be seen by the words of, of the verses in 57 to 62. But when we read verse 62, and Jesus said unto him, see the hymn is, let's just back up to 61. And another also said unto the Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell, which are at home in my house. Jesus answered and said unto him in a most unusual proverb, uh, that dates back to the 8th century, and he said this, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. So an abbreviated version would be this, No man is fit for the kingdom of God that is not committed. Now that's some stunning words. Jesus wasn't just talking to just that man. That is the definition of Christianity. That the idea of looking back and lagging behind and not being engaged, not being involved. Jesus is saying there's a question mark there. There's a lack of fitness for the eternal life, for the kingdom of God, for salvation. So it, it smacks against the idea that just, just be saved is sufficient. It's a call for continual discipleship. So we make the statement, following Jesus, follow me. Following Jesus is three things. Number one, it's a decisive and not progressive. It's a decisive act, not only a decisive act of faith and trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ for the pardoning of our sin to be declared righteous, justification. That is a decisive act but it also entails the continuation of a journey that from day one forward is a decisive act of recommittal each day of the week, each moment. So it involves the body, the mind, the soul, the spirit. Look at verse 23 of chapter nine. And in this verse, Jesus says this, and he said unto them all, if any man will come after me, Later on, he uses the phrase, if any man will follow me. It's the same idea. Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. 
And whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. You see, Jesus was a binary thinker. It was a, one, it was a zero or one. It wasn't 0.5 or 1.5 or something somewhere in the middle. He was binary. You're either all in or you're not in at all. It's just that clear. That's why the language of the, of the verse 23. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Now, for us, it doesn't mean a whole lot. Some people uh, would say that the cross means take up your daily suffering each day. That's what it is to be a follower of Jesus. You're willing to just have a bad day at the office every day of the week. That's not what he's thinking about here. What he's referring to is what everybody in Judaism, especially in Jerusalem, because of the Roman government and their form of capital punishment, they knew that when a... Uh, 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 a criminal, whether he be a robber, a thief, or a traitor, whatever his crime may have been, he was going to a hillside, and there he would be hung on a cross. So you use the word cross to a Jew in Jerusalem, it meant death. It didn't mean anything else. It didn't mean just the period of time of suffering, then after a while it was going to end. It was not temporary, it was permanent. So that's what I mean when Jesus said, follow me, Take up his cross. The, taught, the implication, the thought, is decisive. It's a decisive act of death to self, to our own interests, our own desires, our, our affections that we have for the things of the world and not for God. It's not something that is progressive. Yes, we do grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are taught little by little, line upon line, precept upon precept, of what it is to become more like Jesus. We're not saying that at the day of salvation you are like, you're fully uh, committed, that you are now complete, as in sanctified, full and complete, and entire sanctification. That's what Methodism teaches. That's what Wesleyanism teaches, is that you are baptized by the Holy Spirit, and the moment you're saved, then there is this uh, working toward a complete, entire, sinless life. That's not Christianity. There is the act of faith, but the committal, the I surrender all, I give my all to thee, I follow Jesus, that's a lifetime decisive act of the heart. Secondly, not only is it decisive and not progressive, that is, we eventually decide that someday we will follow. But it's singular without regret. It's a singular event, and there's no looking back. So the first point, decisive and progressive, is implied by the phrase, no man having put his hand to the plow. The ox is pulling the plow, the man puts his hand to it. He has to look straight ahead. He has a target. All the furrows are going to be straight. Looking back, it would create a zigzag line. It's kind of like some people when they're texting, and they're texting off to their right, and their vehicle goes to the right. Some people look at an accident on the left. They automatically go to the left. We call that rubbernecking. And that's the major cause of the southbound accident by looking at the northbound accident. The same as idea is here. No man putting his hand to the plow decisively and then looking back, Jesus says, you are not fit for the kingdom. Our candidate in verse 61 said this, let me first. In other words, my priority is I go to my family and my friends, I bid them farewell. He may have even suggested the idea that he's going to gain some missionary support for his endeavors. But his words, noticed by Jesus, and since Jesus knew his heart, he saw that the man's priorities were family first, then I'm going to go follow the Lord. Now, that is not to say that family is not disrupting the model. What he's saying, what his priorities are, that's the main thing. And so the singular looking, not looking back. No man who puts his hand to the plow and looking back to see what he did, where I was, is instructional. 
So not only demand reveals priority, but we have to understand that it's hard to break away from family ties. It's hard to break away from friendships, especially when they're of not of, of Christian, they're not saved. So the question is, why are you doing this? That doesn't make sense. Why would you leave us? Because you want to be a believer. Why is it that you don't think the way we do and you think differently? You see, that's, that's the result of becoming a believer. And so this singular and no looking back, no regrets, not sorry or disappointed because I professed Christ as my Savior. That's a high calling. That is a, a steep command that Jesus is given to us right away. Is there any other text of Scripture that would help us with that? Well, if you're thinking, you think of the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3. Turn there, if you will. Philippians chapter 3, as Paul summarizes his life as, as a believer. And beginning at verse 8, verse 7, But what things were gained to me, those I count loss for Christ. Nay, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, whom, whom I have suffered the loss of all things, who do count them as manure, that's what the word means there, that I may win Christ. So he's willing to exchange whatever he had in the past, whatever was precious and valuable, whatever his education level may have been. I count all this but loss in exchange for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. I suffer the loss of all things, and I count them as waste, rubbish, that I may win Christ. That is the definition of singular without regret. Paul says, I don't regret giving up what I used to be. Prestige and honor as part of the, of the chief of the Pharisees, the Pharisee of Pharisees. A great resume lies behind him, never to be brought forward to the front again. He let it all go. It's just a living example of what it means to be singular and without any regret. So not only is following Jesus as a decisive act, it's not something that, that happens over a period of time. Following Jesus, follow me in the present tense, do it now. Singular, without any looking back, without thinking twice about it. Not, then we would also find that it's a lifetime commitment and not something that is occasional. It's lifetime. And that's found in the wording going back to uh, Luke chapter 9. When you look at the wording there, we find that he says this, having put his hand to the plow, it is fit, not fit, for the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is both in the idea that there will be the kingdom of God, but it's an eternal kingdom. In other words, it's an ushering into heaven. It is eternal life. And so everything leading up to that what is, but yet not yet, is commitment and living for and modeling and molding our lives after that of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when Jesus says to these men, follow me, and they offer an excuse, he dismisses them. And if Jesus were to do that today, maybe there would be fewer people that claim Christianity than what we have today. Because the false notion that if Christianity just consists of being a believer, end of story. And so the big sacrifice for most people is just making it on a Sunday morning to a worship service. And they think that they've done all their duty. I've done that which was my duty to do. No, when we look at the balance of the message tonight, we will find that it's far more than that because what it's going to do is take us to this, which is only for the purpose of the slide, following Jesus and what does that mean? So that'd be this evening. But in the meanwhile, following Jesus, don't touch it. <laughs> There's enough up there for you to see. Following Jesus is decisive. It's long-term, is for a lifetime, it's singular. 
And so it eliminates the whole idea of a part-time Christianity. Be a Boy Scout, go out camping, you're still a Boy Scout when you're not at the fireside. You could go to attend a church on a regular basis, but if you're not following Jesus Monday through Saturday, then you're not a true candidate as a believer. It's a high price, it's a high demand, and Jesus doesn't back down at all on the subject, and neither should we. So don't lower the expectations. Raise the bar for your own life. Think decisively. Think in a singular fashion. A commitment and a lifetime obligation. And allow that to re remind yourself, as Jesus said, if any man will fall, come after me, let him take up his cross daily. A daily recommitment to being a faithful follower, imitator, of Jesus Christ. So Father, we ask that all of us have been challenged by the baptism of Michael and Brandy, reminding us of our own baptism and our allegiance to you. We are reminded of the call of continual discipleship, the call of continually growing in Jesus, what it means to be a follower, lifetime, singular, decisive commitment. Help us in the journey that we all have in the different ways that you work with us. We pray and thank you for your grace upon us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.